on the right key, I'm talking with the gentleman who created some of the most iconic synthesizers of all time, including the Prophet 5. He's also largely responsible for the creation of the MIDI language, which is used to this day from the largest commercial productions to the smallest and simplest applications on your phone. My guest is Dave Smith. This series was conducted in the spring of 2020 via Instagram, and the audio and video quality do reflect that format. However, the words and insights of these guests are still priceless. Uh, Dave Smith is the founder of synthesizer company Sequential Circuits. He's the inventor of one of the first polyphonic analog synthesizers, the Prophet 5, an instrument which still retains holy status amongst many musicians. He and his company went on to build a number of well-known instruments, including the Sequential Pro 1, the Prophet 600, the Prophet VS, and others. In addition, Dave changed the course of modern music forever as he led the movement to develop MIDI, with his team writing the spec for MIDI that still stands today, MIDI 1.0. Sequential is now back in business and creating beautiful instruments that are loved the world over. So, uh, and there's so much more I could say, but um, people can see that stuff. I really want to, I really want to get inside your thinking a bit. Um, okay. So I'm going to jump around a little bit if you don't mind. And I watched many interviews with you and I saw that when you were in school, you were playing music, you played keyboard and guitar. Uh, bass in one band, guitar in another band. Uh, I actually never played keyboards in a band. Okay. But you were playing bass and guitar. Do you still have a guitar? Uh, yeah, I have a you know, couple in the back here. I have, I have an old uh, Rick 12 string that I've had since late 60s. Uh, so, yeah, it's, you know, as fun as designing uh, since might be, there's something about picking up something and feeling strings vibrate under your fingers and, you know, strings buzzing and strings going out of tune. I mean, there's just something even more organic about it. So it's a nice break. Uh, but that obviously doesn't take anything away from the uh, synthesizers as a musical instrument. They're just different. No, of course, but I, I think it's so great for you to say that and it confirms something that I feel about you and your, your ethos about designing instruments. And you've talked about the idea of synthesizers and hardware synthesizers and the fun of grabbing, grabbing a knob and knowing what's in front of you. And the same joy that you get from playing an instrument that you just say, oh, I'm going to pick up this instrument and play it, is the reason why your synthesizers are fun to play. And e uh even the new ones you're making. That's always a major target for us is the fun aspect. Uh, and that's what it helps us keep the design more constrained as opposed to putting in, you know, uh, a billion features that are really cool, but you have to menu dive to find them. And it's to a certain degree what I had against the uh, software since is that yeah. Things change every month, and you know, I just like the idea that a knob is right here now. It'll be right here in 10 years. It'll be right here in 40 years, and it'll always do the same thing. And it, it, it's a musical instrument. You know, your cello doesn't get new features every 10 years. You That's know, right. you don't buy a new cello because it's got more features than the last cello. It's, you know, it's a specific musical instrument that does what it does. And if you like it, you play it. And since it's a musical instrument, if you don't like that particular synthesizer, it doesn't uh, meet your, it doesn't please your ears. That's okay too. You know, that's why there's, we even ourselves compete against ourselves with so many different uh, varieties of synthesizers. They all, we think they all sound good, but uh you know, it's a personality thing. And the same with guitars, as we all know. Yeah, and I, I think that's that's so fascinating. The thing that that I'm fascinated with in studying your career and and careers of your of your peers uh, is that you're at the crossroads of technology, the intersection of technology and sound, and music. And I think that's a really special place. And you've done something really interesting with it. And you know, the sounds that your instruments create can be highly evocative and they can, they can uh, elicit emotion. Did you feel the same way about the core sounds? At what point did you feel like sound was crossing over to emotive state and 
moving out of right brain to left brain and 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 uh, it's an interesting balance i want to hear more about that that thing because as a musician you feel something in your heart about music and you feel something about the way music should be and the way that music is created and then from the engineering side you think about solving the problem so i'm i'm curious about in your process when sounds start to feel like they move you and they inspire uh, I, you know, that's, it's not a, <clears throat> a specific thing. It's not like I have the sound in my head and that's what I'm going to make. Uh, you know, generally you start with an idea, you know, what different filters sound like, you know, what different oscillators might sound like. You think about, well, how could we package all this in something that might be fun and useful and different? Uh, and, you know, in a way, you almost hope that it sounds good, but you, you never really know until you put it all together, mostly together. I mean, I, I remember doing the Prophet Five. I actually did breadboard, meaning I, you know, with old little pieces of part taped together, I, I made one of the voices and just had a bunch of pots to control it because I kind of wanted to see what it sounded like. It was like, holy shit, this thing kind of sounds really, really good. I can't wait to hear five of them. But right. it's not like I started by saying, these are, the, these are the parts I need to make this sound. It was more like, these are the parts I need to make this instrument, and let's see how it sounds. Um, but there's almost a magical period in the development when we first get to hear a product uh, where the magic moments do happen. You know, I, in the case of the OB6, which is, you know, nicely on display there. In fact, this is perfect because he had the P6 and the OB6. Uh, they when we first played, loved them both. <laughs> exactly, and they're completely different. Uh, but when we were first developing the OB6, I thought, well, you know, this is just another, you know, two VCOs, different filter, but, you know, a lot of it's the same. And I would say, well, you know, what if it just sounds like another polysense? But the first time we all got together in our demo group and sat and put some programs into the OB6 when it was just barely working, we all just looked at each other and said, that, that's Oberheim. There's no question here. It's, wow. you know, but you worry about it until you actually fully implement it because we tend to, when we design something, we go straight to circuit board almost all the time. We design the whole instrument once we have the front panel done and we just build it, the whole thing, and then we start debugging it and making it work, which is a lot in the hardware side and a lot in the software side. Uh, so yeah, we often don't know what it's gonna sound like. We know what an SEM sounds like, so we figured if we put six of them in a box, it would sound like an overhime. But until you actually build it and play it, then you go, oh, this is really cool. Well, you, you know, you, you have such a, and your, your beginnings come from microprocessors, which I think is an interesting place to start synthesizers. Um, and then, you were such a pioneer and a very advanced pioneer with um, with software synthesizers and your seer systems and and that was a really complex uh, piece of software for for its time and and I wonder I wonder if your thinking about developing instruments changed from that process or you felt like it generated a new process for you about how you develop future instruments I know you came back to to analog instruments, or primarily analog instruments and instruments with control, but certainly the, the idea of developing the technology from software, I wonder if that changed your thinking about it or, in, or helped you in a new way. Well, originally, uh, you know, in the 70s, I was actually working with microprocessors as an I engineer yeah. And, yeah. and was just becoming Silicon Valley. And so to me, it was obvious to put the microprocessor together with some uh, synthesizer chipsets and make a programmable polysynth. So in that case, the technology specifically defined the product because it couldn't have been polyphonic and programmable without the microprocessor. And I guess I was lucky to have a little bit of a lead because I had already been working with microprocessors for years. So on that side, yeah, I mean, uh, the technology drove the Prophet 5. It wouldn't have happened without the chipsets and without the microprocessor. Later, uh, you know, post-sequential circuits, you know, I worked for Yamaha for a tiny bit, then I worked for Korg and started the Korg R&D group. 
uh, in San Jose, which is actually, you know, amazingly still there. It's pretty cool. Uh, and I had a wave and, station. Great sense. Yeah. Well, that was the first product that we did at, at Korg R&D. And, you know, I did start getting interested in physical modeling. I got interested in software synthesis. And back then, you really couldn't do it on general purpose hardware. But again, we happened to be, you know, Sears started and then I joined after a while. And it just happened to be right when processors were getting faster for home computers. <clears throat> and in fact, the first soft synth we did was licensed by um, uh, Intel because they wanted something to show what you could do uh, on one of their processors. And it was a little uh, general MIDI soft synth. So I love the concept of being able to add features that you normally wouldn't put in hardware uh, and, you know, the flexibility and all of that. There were obviously some other problems, uh, but um, it just seemed like a good idea. In fact, when we came out with Reality, which was the first soft synth uh, from Sear Systems, mid-90-ish, uh, you know, we said it's the future of music synthesis. That was our tagline. And unfortunately for a while, we were right. <laughs> but, you know, it did, I, the stories, I, I mean, I've said this a million times in, our, in uh, interviews and stuff, but, you know, one day I realized I was never playing with it. And I asked myself why, and it's because it's no fun. I don't want to be yeah, dragging right. my mouse on a screen and doing this and that. I just want to turn a knob and hit notes and, and get immersed with a musical instrument. And that's not to say there's not a lot of advantages to being in the box. One is being in the box. Uh, there's a cost aspect that they're free or cheap. Um, and you can do a lot of things. We see this now. You know, you can go out and get a granular synthesis a piece of software. Granular synthesis is an example of something that sounds really, really cool, but it's somewhat limited in scope. So you can't really make a hardware synth because it's too limited, but it fits perfectly as a software synth uh, feature or product. So um, so that's how I, I drifted away. Uh, the other thing that kind of got me in that direction is Roger Lynn was working on his uh, adrenaline, um, which is kind of a guitar effects box. It's really right. cool. Right. This was probably, geez, late 90s, I guess. And so I ended up helping him just a tiny bit at the end to get it out into production and stuff. And that just doubled down everything. So that's, wow, I could hold this thing. There's, I don't have to deal with somebody else's OS. You know, it's not Mac. It's not PC. It doesn't change every week. It doesn't, I don't have to worry about anybody else. I just make this one piece of hardware and it's done and it's done forever. And that's that got me started. That's when I started uh, Dave Smith Instruments in the, geez, almost 20 years ago. Yike, I'm getting old. Yeah, well, <laughs> well actually that brings up a good question. You know, with, with software, the way that software works now and and uh, you could push updates and you can say, oh, the OS changed. So the, here's this target, I'm gonna, they recoded how we're gonna do it. And we're gonna push an update and we're gonna add new features. With hardware since then you, you're done. How do you know when you're done with a hardware synth? How do, how do you know when the the latest Dave Smith sequential creation is done? Well, it's done when we put it in production. <laughs> you know, until well, actually, usually usually sooner than that. We usually freeze the hardware. You know, especially the mechanical part of it. So we say, here is the front panel. Here are the controls. Here are the switches. That's not going to change. And while we, it always takes longer to finish the software. I mean, you know, we're making an analog synths, but people don't realize that probably the biggest component inside is is software and firmware that's driving all of that. Um, so, you know, we'll be tweaking that to the very end. And sometimes we'll say, hey, let's change this before we ship because this is kind of more fun. And, you know, then we'll go over here and say, oh, this was wrong. Let's add this feature too. Or, let's, you know, this, this kind of sucks. Let's take it out. But the hardware is frozen. And we do tend to update our instruments. I mean, I'm not want to make it sound like, you know, we release something and that's it. There are always going to be little bugs that show up after, you know, the first two or 3,000 people start playing an instrument that we didn't catch. Uh, so we try to keep up on those. Uh, and that's a lot of times we do add features. You know, somebody say, hey, this is this would be kind of cool. And we could put it in here. And it's as long as it's not too silly and too modal as far as trying to find it on the front panel, that's sure. Why not add a, uh, a feature? 
So, yeah, yeah we, we do it, but it's not – in software, you, you can do anything because you have a soft – a soft front panel so you could put add is whatever controls you want and you know scares me when i see some of these products you know you click on filter and they have a list of 50 filters to pick from <laughs> like hey, what really I, i'm going to go through 50 filters and you know try to determine the subtle differences uh you know we're guilty of that somewhat because the pro 3 has three filters on it but of course in that, about the pro 3. <laughs> yeah in that case Every, each of the three uh, filters, you know, is firmly uh, grounded in history. So it's not like, uh, you know, we have five version, two pole, four pole, six pole, eight pole, well, you know, this, that, this, that. No, well, we have an SEM, we have a ladder, and we have, a, you know, a, basically a profit five filter. So, um, you know, we do mix things up somewhat. But again, in our case, you have a switch. You pick this, that, or that. If you're not dragging things and... Uh, so forth. But, you know, some people like that amount of functionality and, uh, you know, the, the choices of things you can do. So I, I, I don't want to say, you know, one way is better than the other. It's more that our preference on how we do things might be different than how other people. So I don't want to make it sound like I'm trashing other products. It's more just that's not the way we like to do things. And I'm trying to explain why. So yeah, no, I, <laughs> I don't I, like it. I, I, I get that, and I, and I know that you're you're very inclusive and supportive of your uh, fellow developers on your, especially on your level, because you're not you're not currently a big company, and I I want to see sequential flourish, especially in this market, you know, and with what's going on right now. The reason that I was asking about Seer Systems was specifically because of the Pro Three. It's such a hybrid synth, and it's really incredible the, with the wavetable stuff, melding with VCOs and and all of the and a good component of software, were you able to see some of that coming with your software background? At this point, having developed so many synths, did you have a vision about how it would sound or was it a complete mystery until you were close to being done? On the Pro 3 specifically? Yeah. Uh, no, I, well, yes and no. Uh, we knew what the three filters sound like. I mean, you know, that's kind of a yeah, no brainer. Right. It did take a lot of hardware tweaking and software tweaking to get them to behave together. You know, so when you change filters, the sound doesn't change completely, you know, so they're all in tune with each other. But at the same time, you don't want to take away the personality of each filter. So there's a lot of work there. Uh, the wavetable thing actually had a much longer development time, you know, even after we built our first hardware uh, version of the Pro 3, you know, we kind of were thinking, oh, we'll probably do this, but we hadn't really worked on it yet. And then when we finally got into it, we said, oh, well, we better figure out how this works. And so we talked about a lot of different ways and we came up, uh, you know, because we all like the idea of being able to uh, morph through multiple wavetables but we wanted to do it in a somewhat controlled fashion so that you're not just randomly going through things. And that's when we came up with the idea of, okay, this set has a bunch of related waves, which could be very different than the next set of related waves. So uh, so that actually didn't even happen until after the hardware uh, was done. We had, okay, well, we had this shape mod knob. It has to do something, which it'll do. And uh, we were real happy with the way it turned out. I mean, it just, the, it's such a good contrast to the VCOs and yeah. can take your, a, a sound in a completely different direction. And then, of course, when you add them both together, it's pretty awesome. And now I'm sounding like a commercial. But, uh, no, it's, I, I think it's fantastic. And I think, I don't think you're over exaggerating because the way the wavetable part of it sounds is just amazing. And surely some of that must have had to come from your work with the VS, uh, some of the knowledge about that. Well, the VS was done in such a completely different way. Uh, Wavetables are a funny thing. And, you know, there's a lot of history. You know, there was the VS, there was the PPG, um, you know, and the Evolver for that matter. Uh, you know, I was trying to do something different. So I had uh, two DCOs in that case, and I had the, the wave tables from the Profit VS in there specifically. Uh, I was trying to do kind of a marriage of hybrid uh, analog and digital, just something new. And that's where the idea of uh, tuned feedback came and a lot of other things. So there was a lot of innovation in the Evolver, but when I first came out of it, 
with it, you know, you know, who's Dave Smith Instruments, because, you know, it, I didn't use the old names. And, you know, it took a while for people to realize. And, of course, now everybody wants a poly evolver because it's one of the most unique instruments in the world because uh, yeah. it's so different. Uh, but, you know, in our case, this is a good example, the wavetables. It's all evolutionary. Uh, we don't tend to make huge jumps and try something completely off the wall. Uh, like doing this wavetable, the wavetables like we did in the Pro 3, uh, it's much different than anything I've done before or we've done before. And it was a clever idea and it's new, but it's in in its heart, it's still wavetables. I mean, the Prophet 12 had digital wavetables uh, for its oscillators. And it had some, yeah, and same for the Pro 2, and it had a little bit of wave morphine that you can do. You could pick three different wavetables and, you know, go between them and stuff. So, you know, we, we've we touched on it, we've done it, and but each time it's different. So that that's what I enjoy because there's always a way to take different ideas, put them together, and end up with something awesome. So, <laughs> Well, I, I'm really excited to see what comes next. And it's just over there, right? It's yeah. it's kind of over here. So if, the if new I drop thing. The, the new <laughs> thing. I know. Yeah. You know, someday it would be really fun to just – be able to talk about what we're developing and, you know, do an Instagram thing as we do it and things like that. But I, 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 I don't like building expectations or, wow, um, leave a or getting, people, getting people excited about something that may come out too late. And, and then if you have uh, scheduling problems or it takes longer, like the Pro 3 was supposed to be out a few months before it finally got out. And there was four reasons like the wavetables – and other stuff, that, you know, it just was a lot slower. So if we had been talking about it all along, uh, and then all of a sudden, it's six months later than what we said, it'd be a little embarrassing. So I, it's better to just, you know, wait till it's done and, you know, dump it on the world. And, and this actually is different. And I don't know how I got caught in this, but I have been dropping hints about a new product, you know, late summer, early fall. And so I'm... Yeah, we don't even usually do that, but it's. I don't uh, think anybody's gonna hold it against you. <laughs> well, you it's still nobody knows what it is. It's it's kind of fun to see what people guess. You know, well, it might be this, maybe it's that. Oh, I want this, and I want that. So, and you know, obviously, once in a while, somebody will guess it. You know, exactly or close, but you know, it's 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 what it is. <laughs> Yeah, and you and you work together with your team. I imagine you sitting. I have this vision of you sitting at home working at a table, and you've got some bits of hardware and some bits of software. And I guess I keep poking at this idea about software developing. Are you developing parts in software in a design format, and then people realize them in hardware for you, and they bring them over, and you see what they feel like? Or I can't imagine you're sitting there with a soldering gun on and. And, uh, or maybe you are right here. But I've been <laughs> using a lot, tweaking the hardware on this new product. No, we we get our hands dirty. Uh, you know, the process is probably like most companies. You know, first we decide what the front panel is as far as the actual controls, and then we lay them out the way we like them, and you know, do a silk screen, and and then we you know do the mechanical design, which of course is a matter of using design software and sending it out so somebody does a metal, somebody does a wood. Uh, and then we lay out circuit boards. Uh, you know, we have our hardware engineer, Tony Karavitas, usually does the circuit boards. I actually did a couple of them on this next product. I used to do them all. I, yeah, I mean, everybody knows for the first five years of Dave Smith Instruments, it was just me. So I did the hardware and, you know, circuit board design, schematic design, mechanical design, all the software and all that. So then, anyhow, we have a team of software guys who do all the firmware, and I do a lot of that myself also. Um, so, you know, it's that's always been my background, and that's the thing I love most is working on both hardware and software. There's something really fun about where they intersect, and that to me that's where the magic is, you know, because – when you're designing it, you're, especially when I was doing it back by myself, well, you, we still do this now. You say, okay, well, there is this idea, and well, well, we could do this in hardware, but it would cost $20 and it might be complicated. But here's something that only costs 
20 cents or it's free because we can do it in software. Uh, so, you know, which one do we really want? And, you know, so you have a lot of choices on how things are implemented. And our team has gotten to the point where we all kind of just inherently know all this stuff. So, you know, things always start in a whiteboard and we'll scribble something up there and somebody will say, yeah, that works great. And then only, you know, we'll have to add three PCAs per voice to do that. Well, is that too much? Well, no, it's a really cool feature. But, you know, so we don't have to actually sit down there and pencil out how much parts cost. We just have done this for so long that we just kind of know instinctively <laughs> what to expect. Well, you're a really, you have a history of being a great team leader, and you've worked with a number of teams uh, with sequential circuits and with your other companies and even with your spearheading of the MIDI spec. And you work really well with your team. Now I had the pleasure to meet some of those folks at the office in San Francisco. How does that team cooperation work? How do other ideas play? How do you inspire? How do they inspire you with, with uh, the exchange of ideas? Uh, well, there's a number of different ways. First, I should clarify that I think I'm a good team leader for designing since, but I'm a horrible company manager. Uh, <laughs> I just, I'm not good at that at all and try to avoid it and sometimes to a fault. So everybody who works at Sequential knows that and, you know, knows what to expect. But no, I just, uh, uh, that, that part I, I don't like. But as far as uh, getting the group together to z design a synth, uh, yes, I, I, I'm pretty good at that. And, you know, one of the reasons we changed the name from Dave Smith Instruments to Sequential is because it's not just me anymore. I mean, we've got this team and everybody's involved. You know, we, you know, we only have 15 people uh, and everybody kind of has a job title, but that's in some ways meaningless because everybody does a lot of different things. So when we have our first design meetings, we're on the whiteboard and we're just writing stuff up and people are throwing out ideas and we have arguments and sometimes it's very uh, strongly felt arguments. Uh, and, you know, so sometimes I get to be the lucky guy to make the final call. But most of the time we come to consensus, you know, so it's not me saying this is what we're going to do, period. Shut up. Uh, once in a great while, maybe, but um, you know, it, it really is a, a team thing, and everybody's a synth nut, and everybody comes from a slightly different background, so the ideas just come together. And as we've been doing this, you know, we've really had one person leave the company in 15, 20 years, and we haven't hired anybody in three or four years. So you know, again, it's just a family thing at this point. We're just so good at interacting and getting things done that uh, it, it's it, a lot it of It really fun. feels like that. It really feels like that. And you'll always have my dollars when I'm buying new new gear because I really, I support that and I support what you guys are doing completely. And everybody I talk to feels the same way about it. And you see all the hearts coming up here. You can see that a number of people <laughs> feel the same way. I want to ask some questions about technology because I'm you, you're fascinating to me with this, your lifelong interest in technology and uh, there's, a, there's a music writer named Jay Frank. He wrote a, a very interesting book called Future Hit DNA. And Jay Frank asserts that technology drives uh, creativity and not the other way around. It's as opposed to as, you know, much to the chagrin of many artists who would think it's the other way. Uh, you must agree to that to some degree, right? Well, that's true historically. For any year you pick in any century, the technology drives the musical instruments. You know, the piano came from a technological improvement from a harpsichord. You know, a flutes got in, developed into, you know, when it's just a bam piece of bamboo that somebody put some holes into it. You know, that was the best technology at the time, uh, you know. Pipe organs are awesome. You know, they're the world's first synthesizers or certainly an attempt to be an entire orchestra. And it was, had to do with how much air they could blow through brass or wood pipes that are controlled by a keyboard somehow. Uh, so it, it's always been technology. You know, how do you build a saxophone? You know, where did that come from? You know, uh, you know, brass makers. You know, I, I, you know, I don't understand any of that stuff, but it's it's basically the best metal working at the time that developed a lot of those instruments. So it's always been that way. This is this is no different. Um, and but 
I keep trying to separate the technology from the musicality. You know, yes, this is a, a big pile of, of electronics and, you know, parts and, you know, People think of that as cold, you know, because there's nothing that really vibrates, you know, there's no resonance, you know, it's, but, you know, it's just a different kind of instrument. You know, if we, if people had these instruments 100 years ago or 200 years ago, they would have loved them, you know, it's, but, you know, the technology wasn't there. And right. it's, it's funny because it's also, you know, people ask, well, do you ask a bunch of musicians what they want before you develop something? And sure, we talk to people, but it's not. <laughs> this isn't going to sound good, but it's not like uh, the average uh, musician is going to know what technology is available, so what might be possible to put in the next instrument. We're the ones who know that, and so we have to decide what we think musicians are going to want, and that's discounting the fact that most of us are musicians, uh, maybe not at your level, <laughs> but, you know, we all are involved with music. A lot of our guys have home studios, so we're all involved with music. So it, the music's in our soul as much as the technology. So, yeah. but yeah, you know, we, you don't know what we're going to build next and you don't know why. Uh, on the other hand, it's real easy for our uh, musicians to make comments about our instruments after we bring them out. You know, oh, why didn't you do this? You should have added this. Or I really like this, but I don't like that. And of course, but you know, you ask ten musicians what they think, and you'll get ten answers, which is fine. It's a musical instrument. It's the way it should be. Do you even venture an idea of what synthesizers are going to look like in ten or twenty years, or do you just let it let let? Uh... I have absolutely no idea. If you had asked me when I came out with the Prophet 5 that we'd be doing this sort of, you know, these are all basically Prophet 5s, you know, they're mi microprocessor controlled uh, analog circuitry. So it's kind of the same thing. And I, I never would have predicted that. But, you know, we went through, I do think we went through what I call the digital dark ages where there was nothing analog and everything was, you know, okay, here's this year's workstation. It has more voices, it has more bits, it has more sounds, but they're workstations. I mean, who came up with that name? You know, I want fun stations. I want, you know, and so they're, they, they were all, you know, and I, this, this doesn't sound good, but they're somewhat interchangeable. You know, once the M1 came out, everything for 20 years after was an M1. Uh, and there was very little going on in what I call the musical instrument side of it. And so that's what we've brought back. And I've been thrilled to to see that we have a very successful company now and people are willing to pay what it costs to buy an OB6 or a Profit 6. And uh, and they value it. They see the how they could have that for 100 years. And in this, this case, they, they'll actually work beyond 10 years as opposed to the uh, originals, which of course you have to be very careful with if you want to keep them running. Right. Well, I'm not going to take too much more of your time. I just have a couple other questions. When you were at Lockheed, you were working your, uh, as you called it, your day job at Lockheed working on microprocessors <laughs> and your night fascination with synthesizers. What's your evening fascination now? What do you do in your spare time? Uh, you know, I don't have any main thing I do at night now. You know, I, I have to say that as I get a bit older, I, I, I certainly don't have the drive that I did, you know, in the early days where I would just work all the time or whatever it took to get the product done. Uh, you know, I didn't mind it. It was fun. I mean, that, that's what I did, you know. And even now, it's almost like designing synths is my hobby. You know, it's kind of like, you know, I can quit, I can retire, but, you know, I, I really, really like what I'm doing and doing it with the, uh, with our team. Uh, so, you know, I don't think I have, you know, sometimes I just flake out like everybody else at night and just don't do anything. Uh, you know, I, 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 I wish I had a really cool answer for that question, but I don't. <laughs> and actually, uh, uh, there's another question, um, and Jeff Babco gave me this question, you know, Jeff Papko, the great keyboard player, he said, he said, how can you be such a synth pioneer and be so chill? <laughs> <laughs> you are very relaxed. And you all, you've always had this positive energy. And every time I've seen you at the show and I see people and they're so stressed out and, and you just seem to be mellow and, and enjoying it. it. It's taken time, but I've tried to, 
I try to be that way, you know. I, I learned a lot, actually, from sequential circuits because, you know, I was still in my 20s. I didn't know what I was doing. We had like 180 people at one time at the company, and it was just stress city. It actually got to the point where I realized I couldn't quit my job. You know, I was running this company, but I couldn't just quit. Of course, that kind of resolved itself, unfortunately. But, uh, you know, that – and that's why this time I started a company with just me for five years, because uh, I just, you know, I don't want the complications, uh, though obviously it did get to a point where I decided employees were a really, really good thing, especially if you have the right ones. And yeah, it's great right now. But yeah, I just, uh, I really enjoy going out and seeing concerts. I've just in the last few years, I've gotten a lot more to go into a lot of uh techno shows uh, and hanging out with DJs, which is always fun. I mean, you can't help but to be relaxed and just have a good time. I mean, it's all about having fun, listening to music. Uh, a lot of times I'll see a band and I'll go, well, this, I probably wouldn't listen to this at home, but this is really, really good right now because it's live and it's happening. It's on a stage. Uh, you know, there's something about live music that to me is just magical and uh, I, I love it. So, yeah, I think... Anyhow, I don't have an answer specifically, but you know, I just try to, I just try to have fun and not take. I try not to stress out. You know, I don't want to stress about the company, and that's one of the reasons we're we're not growth oriented. You know, we just our growth is organic. If we come out with a product and people like it and they buy a lot, then we grow a little. But as I mentioned earlier, we haven't hired anybody in three or four years, so uh, you know, it just. Uh, <laughs> we were, it just hasn't happened. We we're in a good size, and we're actually getting through the craziness right now. Everybody's working at home. Uh, you know, this is the room I work in. It's my business office and my studio and my work office. So I've got I could do everything from this room, uh, but everybody else is working from home also. Um, but you know, it, it works, and, and business is actually good. As you know, a lot of people are staying home and buying new scents, which is a good thing. Yeah. Stuck at home and, my, we'll have fun. and my last question, uh, for those who, who've been to the NAM show and they've seen your booth late in the day, they know that occasionally tequila is around. <laughs> in fact, there are Dave Smith and uh, Sequential and Pro 2 shot glasses. I have some of them for tequila. Uh, why tequila and not mezcal? Uh, well, mezcal is actually kind of a Johnny come lately. I know it's been around forever, but it's only lately that it's being marketed. But tequila actually goes back to the sequential circuits days. Uh, that was sort of a company drink back then, even though the, the tequila back then was absolutely atrocious. Uh, <laughs> I, obviously, in the last 10 or 20 years, tequila has gotten really a lot better. And I've always liked it, and it always just seems to be uh, – it just it just fits with the uh, company culture. Uh, it was funny the first couple NAM shows I went to uh, as Dave Smith Instruments. They just had a little tiny ten by ten booth, and I I would bring some wine down, you know, which is kind of illegal, but we did it anyhow because we live up here in Napa Valley, you know, so we're in wine country. And after the first couple of years of doing that, we realized, you know, this is too much stuff to bring because wine bottles are big and heavy. If we bought tequila we could get a whole lot more out of one bottle than um, we do out of a bottle of wine. So uh, that's when we started. And then I think, I think we had an Evolver shot glass might've been the first one, or maybe the Profit 8 was the first one. I, I forget whose idea it was, but we just have been doing it ever since. And so we probably had 10 or 12 uh, different shot glasses because we tend to do one for every instrument. And it's, but yes, at the NAM shows, I, it got to the point when we had a big booth that I would be taking many shots a day with friends <laughs> like you and other musicians. Uh, and of course it was illegal. I have a feeling Nam knew about it, but probably just let us get away with it because they like to have little cool Nam things that happen. Uh, but it was fun. I mean, you know, doing shots with, uh, you know, Don Buchla or well, I, I, I just... You know, there's an endless list of of people, and you know who you are. <laughs> All of the Dead President Society at some point, probably. Right. Sure. Yeah. Well, now that's getting to be a smaller group, so. 
<laughs> yeah, it is getting into a smaller group. And but now some of those guys are are back working again. I mean, uh, Keith has, has Keith McMillan has his products, and Tom is doing stuff again. And yeah. you know, Roger Lynn. He, he, it always struck me how patient he was with demonstrating the little instrument over and over and over again. I couldn't do that, but yeah, <laughs> I, I had the same uh, amazement when I would see him do that. Uh, but he doesn't do that anymore, I noticed. So. <laughs> yeah, well, Dave, thank you so much for sharing a little bit of time and a little bit of uh, insight. I hope that we got to talk about some things that you don't always talk about. And, and uh, I really appreciate the work that you're doing and all the work that you've done. And, and it's very special for everybody. Well, thank, thank you. you. I appreciate that. Yeah, and it, it, we did go in some different directions, so that was good. I always hear from uh, my my guys that they'll say, "Hey, I, you finally said something different," or "I didn't know that," because you know they're so used to hearing the same old shit from me. So uh, that was good. That was fun. Uh, thanks for setting it up, um, and uh, we'll see you if there is an, ever another Nam show. Uh, we'll hang out or. Uh, Definitely. Some other Definitely. We're overdue. And I'll be buying the new things that you make, I'm quite sure. So. <laughs> That's have, music in my ears. Have okay. a great day. Thanks, Henry. All right. Bye. We'll see you. Bye. Thanks for joining me for this episode of The Right Key. If you enjoyed the episode, there's a lot more coming. Please click the subscribe and like buttons below. If you want to know more about me or our guests, you can find lots of information in the link just below the video. See you next time.